So when I talk about the heart, I should explain that just as we have a physical body, we also have a spiritual body. For most people, their spiritual body is dormant until it becomes activated, as you ask this in question about awakening of the heart, um, which is, in Sufism, this moment of the heart awakening is called tauba, or the turning of the heart, in which the spiritual center of the heart starts to spin at a higher vibration that begins to give you access to spiritual consciousness. And it is said this moment of tauba, the awakening of, of the heart, is always an act of grace. It, it is given to the human being um, because, well, it is an act of grace. It is, it is said, Allah guides to Allah whom Allah will. But you can do the preliminary work to prepare for it, work of inner purification, of living with the right attitude, of aspiration, all of those spiritual qualities of turning towards God. But um, even, for example, the great Sufi saint Rabia, who was one of the first Sufi saints to actually talk about love, divine love, somebody asked her, if I renounce the world and turn towards God, will God turn towards me? And she said, no, God first has to turn towards you, and then you turn towards God. So the awakening of the heart is always an act of grace. The Sufis actually have a very detailed description. They talk about the different chambers of the heart. In one of my recent book, Fragments of a Love Story, I have a chapter about this. There are all these different chambers within the heart which you access through deeper and deeper states of prayer and meditation that take you right back to ultimate truth. And Sufism has really developed a spiritual science of the heart. The, the heart is quite extraordinary. It can be as big as a uni the universe. You can put, you know, the, it expands as a human being develops in their spiritual practice. The heart center gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, um, and the love, experience of love gets greater and greater. But to be very specific, yes, one has, every human being has a spiritual organ of divine consciousness, which is what we call the heart. In most human beings, it's latent. But when you begin the spiritual journey, or it begins within you, then it becomes activated. And as I say, Sufism has really developed a, a very detailed science of the spiritual heart and how to make the journey back to God within the energy center of the heart. Yeah. The Sufis would say that the, the longing is already God's presence within you. You wouldn't experience longing if you were not aware of what you longed for. If you are living in a complete state of unconsciousness, why would you long for God? But when God looks towards you and touches your heart with his or her, with divine presence, then that awakens the longing within your heart, what St. Augustine called the divine discontent. And in a way the, the the spark of divine consciousness, if you like, gets blown upon in your heart. The embers get blown upon. And then out of that, there is this awakens, this longing, this homesickness. You want to go home. And that is the start of the journey. But some people are born with longing because they don't forget. They are just the soul impresses into the human consciousness the remembrance of where they have come from so strongly that they don't forget. But most human beings, it seems, this is part of the, 
the mystery of human beings is that they forget. I always remember this experience I had in a waiting room in Seattle airport. It was between flights and, um, and people were standing around as they do in waiting rooms in airports talking or reading newspapers. And I just saw how every human being was completely filled up with God except for the last little bit. And I saw that the mystery was not that we were God, but that we'd forgotten we were God. And that is really the great human mystery is, is that we have forgotten. It, the fact that everything in, is, is God is in a way the most obvious thing. It, it's the, 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 the real human mystery is that we've forgotten this. And most human beings live their whole life in a state of forgetfulness. But the moment you get awakened to the remembrance of your divine nature, then the longing begins, then the journey begins. Which is why the Sufi says traditionally, don't look for water, be thirsty. They know that the longing is the most direct way back to God. It's not a concept, it's an experience. And it draws you or you follow that thread within your heart that takes you home. That longing is sadly in this culture because we don't understand it very much. Often people who have longing misdiagnose it as depression, and which is sad because it won't be solved with antidepressants. Yeah. There is the danger on the spiritual journey of a spiritualized ego in which the ego self, which is really, as I say, what separates us from our divine consciousness, um, creates an image of a spiritual self which it, it identifies with. Um, traditionally, you actually need a teacher to tell you, look, you know, you're kidding yourself. Um, somebody who knows, who can see what's going on. If you don't, if you're lucky, life will deliver you a crushing blow. Um, and you will kind of wake up out of it. The, I think on the spiritual path, humility is very important. If you don't have the humility to realize you're wrong most of the time, then um, do something else. <laughs> you know, nowadays most people can climb Everest or something, can't they? If they really put their mind to it, you get a guide and you go, I mean, do that, you get real results. Um, but, you know, I, I'm kind of old school, so I take spiritual life very seriously and I don't, like to see somebody wasting all their time and effort and intention with a spiritualized ego. But if you are really sincere, something will come and dispel your self-illusion. You can always, you know, we work a lot with dreams in our path, and you can always tell when a dream is a little bit too perfect, when the spiritual states are a little bit too right, when the guidance is a little bit too good, and it just, it smells a bit prepackaged. <laughs> but it's something you really need to be careful of. And sadly, in this culture, um, it's much easier to sell ego spirituality than real spirituality. Uh, one of the things is you can't charge for real spirituality, so there's not a lot of profit to be made from it. But ego spirituality, you can market and, you know, and make a good living from, so it's, it's much easier. It's also, what is interesting is, um, something I discovered is something is a bit corrupted, it's actually more tangible for people. If something is really pure, it's, it's a bit too fine, it's not so visible. You know, spirit, real spiritual life is terribly ordinary, um, and that doesn't, people want to be a bit different, they want to be special, and you know you can make a nice spiritual special 
ego. But who wants to be just an ordinary human being? I, I always like this saying of Hamlet, I am myself indifferent, honest. You know, Um, now, this is an important question because it has to do with the path of service, which Sufism is, which in Buddhism would be the Bodhisattva path. There are spiritual paths um, where you just completely turn away from the world. Um, you know, you, it's not so easy now, but a while ago you'd find yourself a nice cave in the Himalayas and you know, get a bowl of rice every couple of weeks. And, um, you go completely inward. You can go, you know, you go really deep and really in inner states of consciousness. This world fades away very quickly. Um, there's not much to attract you to being in this world. What the Buddhists call this world of samsara, of illusion, suffering. And you, you go into states of, of nirvana. You go very, very, very deep states of meditation. And you don't come back. I mean, the physical body remains as long as it remains, and then you just, the individual consciousness dissolves into universal consciousness. And you don't come back. The, the bodhisattva path, or in Sufism, I had this experience actually when I was 23. At this time, I went a certain, a lot of very, very powerful spiritual experiences. And I remember I was. Um, I was standing in a park, and I suddenly got taken out through the top of my head. And I was told, you could go now. And I remember saying very clearly, no, I am a Sufi, I am in service. And I came back. And looking, I didn't really understand it then, I was just 23. Um, looking back, I know how easily it would have been just to have had a heart attack and just to have gone. You dissolve in the light. but. Sufism is, in Sufism it is said, after the state of union, of oneness, comes the station of servanthood. Um, and so that is the, Sufism is a path of service. Some people are in service in the outer world, some people are in service in the inner world. There are different places, different ways to be of service. So there is these two, um, in a way, distinct spiritual paths. And you do get a choice at certain times on the path. You can't go until you've paid off your debts in this world, what they call karmas. Um, you don't get the choice. Um, and some people, when they die, they get the choice to come back, to be in service, or just to go off either into other worlds, because this physical world is just one world of many, many worlds, um, or to dissolve into the light, just to dissolve and go back to the source return to the nothingness. It, it was interesting, I saw a science program the other day about time and the galaxies, and they said, yes, everything in this galaxy, in, in, in all of the galaxies in the universe, will eventually return completely to non-existence. All the stars will have burst, will have contracted the dark. And it was interesting the time scale that they had for this to happen. They said, imagine an atom is a year. Now imagine all the atoms in the known universe. That is the number of years it would take for this to happen. So my sense is, you know, for the foreseeable future, there's going to be a bit to do. <laughs> if not in this world, in another world, in an inner world, there are many different worlds. And sometimes when you finish working in this world, you get go and work somewhere else. Yeah. Yes, I think, for example, at this time, there is a deep need to hold an awareness of the remembrance of God in our daily life. Now, what that does is that creates a center of light in the inner worlds that is present in this world. We live in a world of so much forgetfulness of the divine. I would say we have forgotten so much, we have even forgotten that we have forgotten. It is not present in our collective consciousness, hardly at all. 
And that makes it very, very difficult for people. It's as if some essential note in life, some resonance of the soul has been forgotten. Now, if you live that simple awareness, what Sufis call the remembrance of God, or the awareness of the divine, that means in you, in your daily life, wherever you go, that light is present. And that nourishes life in the deepest sense. A human being who remembers God in their daily life, even just for five minutes a day, is a tremendously beneficial influence on their surroundings. And that is a work in the inner world because nobody can notice it. It, it, it is real and it is, I think, of utmost importance at this time. There is other work that can be done on the inner worlds, but um, that is, there is a pressing need to do that. The particular, I give you a slightly different example, which I actually described last time, that in the, in the last few years, the, the, the group I work with, we have been directed to, to work or to work more directly with the soul of the world, what's called the anima mundi, the spiritual body of the world, because that has been dying through neglect, through abuse, through what we have been doing to the environment. And there's a certain prayer and remembrance and connection that, um, again, in this little book on prayer I just published, um, I have a chapter on the prayer for the earth, as a way to connect one's spiritual devotion, one's spiritual awareness, <coughs> one's prayer with the, the anima mundi, with the spiritual body of the world, so that some, there can be some healing that can help the soul of the world, help the spiritual body of the world at this time of um, ecological and spiritual crisis. So that's another example of um, working in the inner world. <coughs> Um, there are some souls who are taught how to help people to die, how to help their soul make that transition from this world to the other world. There are different, there is different work to do in the inner world, but I think the most central is just the simple remembrance of God, awareness of God in one's daily life. I think it is very beneficial to the environment. For I give you a simple um, example because Mercy Center here is a spiritual center because there are nuns here who have been doing practices for, you know, for many years. There is a certain energy present here, which means when I come here and give a spiritual talk, I don't have to start from scratch. There is already a ground here. I hate giving talks in hotels. I don't really do it anymore because you have to use the first half of the talk to clear a space from all the worldly thought forms that are present in the hotel you know, all the affairs that are being held in all the different rooms and the, it's all there and you have to, you know, the first time you have to clear it of all of that before there can be any living remembrance of God that is um, made alive. But here, because there is already spiritual work has been done here for many years, there's a certain energy present. It, it, it also has to do with a state of being. We live in a culture that's very masculine that values action rather than being. And a lot of spiritual work, which typically to do with the inner, has to do with a state of being. Yes, the pain of longing. Give me the pain of longing, the pain of longing, and I will pay any price you ask. Give the joy of love to others. Do me the pain of love. Why? Because Longing, the pain of love, takes you back to God, takes you home. And it kind of turns you from this world back to God. It wrenches your heart. In my own experience and also in other people, the initial intensity of that longing you cannot live with for more than five, six, seven, eight years. It would just be too intense. You cry too much. You, 
I always give the example of when Mrs. Tweedy went to India, she had a blue handkerchief and she kept it when she came back and it had been turned white, by bleached by all the tears she cried. Real longing, if you know. It, it tears your heart apart. I don't think there's anything more painful because it's everything else you can blank off, but this is your own heart that's been torn apart. But it does turn you away from this world, turns you back to God. It takes you on the way back to God. In my experience, there, there comes a time when the longing gets less intense. And many people have come to me and they felt they're doing something wrong because the initial longing isn't there anymore. And I think it's because it's done its work and it's really... Um, I often use the, the, the example of St. Teresa's stages of prayer because I like St. Teresa very much and she really articulated the stages of prayer. And, and she says at the beginning you have to make it stick. You have to return to it and return to it and return to it and make it stick. And the, the Sufi has the image of light upon light. Light rises towards light and light comes down upon light. When your heart cries for God, when you have this longing, particularly in the night, you cry to God. And what you're not aware of is that your cry to God is echoed, is met by a light coming down. Your aspiration going to God is met by the light coming towards you of God. You feel alone, you feel abandoned, you feel lost, but actually your aspiration brings down the light of God. And like St. Teresa says, there comes a time when it sticks. This is what the Sufis call the mystery of light upon light. When they meet, and, and then the longing changes into belonging, really. It still comes back when you feel you don't belong, when you feel feel abandoned, and and it can come back, but not with that original intensity. And and then you just feel you belong, and you are you get taken into other states. But really, the initial agony of separation passes away. It uh, although it is sometimes replaced by something that is even more difficult to bear, which is nothing. There is a time on the path of when it seems completely, completely empty. There is nothing. Um, it is like in being in a desert. And you actually long for the pain of longing because at least then you felt you aspired to God. At least then you felt you were alive. And, you know, you were called, you were your heart was singing even if, it was with, even if it was with blood. But this next stage of, of desolation, of complete nothing, where there seems to be no longing, no God, you're just alone day after day after day, and that initial intensity is no longer with you, I think that is even more difficult to bear. Um, and then one day that passes too. Suddenly there are not just, I always say, there are like flowers appear amidst the stones. And then something changes. And then comes a time when you know you are always with God. And whatever happens, whatever you do, whatever you don't do, you're always with God. You can never... They, they say he is the companion of he who remembers him. It is this companionship. It is this deep belonging. It is this... You are just with God. And then one day even that goes because there's nobody there to be with God. It's just something else. But... So, belonging is, I think, a very valuable stage, but yes, it does pass. I, I like this saying of um, the Prophet Muhammad, if the world is going to end tomorrow, plant a tree. Um, just plant a tree. Just, that's why I said to the city, just hold the remembrance of God, I think. Yes, I agree we're on a Titanic and we're sailing towards a cataclysm. It's visible in the, the ecological cataclysm is, is as visible as our denial of it is visible. Um, and they're meeting this, this week in Doha to deny it all again, to say, well, in 2015 we might make a decision. Um, and in the last two or three years, I've been given the very 
unpopular job of suggesting that there is a spiritual cataclysm as well, that what is happening in the outer world is reflected in the inner worlds, that our treatment of the environment our mirrors such a deep disregard for the sacred nature of life, the sacred nature of creation, that is having, as I say, a terrible effect to the soul of the world, to the inner spiritual body of the planet, that I don't know if it goes on much longer, how long it can sustain the spiritual evolution of human beings. A certain substance, I call it the sacred substance of creation, is being lost. Um, and you know, it is like the ecologists, some say we've already passed the tipping point. It's already too late. But does that mean you stop remembering God? No. And either because there is a possibility for grace, which is a mystic I believe in completely, the possibility for grace, or because that's what you do. Um, you know, a plumber fixes sinks. A mystic remembers God. Um, like Blake said, we are put on earth a little space to learn to bear the beams of love. And you don't bear it just because things are going well. You bear it because you bear it. You remember God because you remember God. Sufis gather together because that's what they do. There's actually a lovely story of Sufi story of, of Bukhara and there was um, the Mongols were coming, and so everybody fled to the hills. But there was a Sufi there, and he was a weaver. And he just continued doing his weaving. And so the Mongols came, and, and they were so astounded to meet this guy who was just doing his weaving that they took him to Genghis Khan, or one of his sons. And, and he, said, he said, you know, what are you doing sitting here? Everybody is run. Everybody is frightened. Everybody is terrified. And the, uh, the Sufi weaver, he said, well, my outer attention was with my weaving. My inner attention was with the remembrance of God. What time do I have to be afraid? And the, the Khan was so impressed by his attitude that he didn't destroy the city. And, you know, maybe we can be that person so that it doesn't get destroyed. If you realize, even in the physical world, how you are part of everything, the food you eat, what nourishes you, comes from now many different places in the world. We are nourished by the, by the rain, by the water, by the earth, by the, I guess, by the drugs nowadays, aren't we? Um, by the fertilizer. Nothing is separate. We, we are part of this living whole. It, it is the great illusion our culture has kind of perpetrated on us, that we are this separate individual. And yes, we have a unique consciousness, but we are part of this living membrane of life, like I said, this Indra's net. It doesn't belong to us, the world doesn't belong to us. We may try to think it does, but we learn to work with it, we learn to breathe with it. Every breath, the air comes into us from somewhere and nourishes us and then goes back. We are part of this whole cycle of nature, this whole cycle of life, and on the deepest sense, the whole cycle of the divine coming into manifestation with every breath and then going back to the inner worlds. And once you realize that you are just part of this whole living, breathing system, or not even system, living, breathing being, divine being. It is divine. Our divinity is just an inherent part of what is. It's not special to us. It is everything is divine. We have just forgotten that. Then maybe you can put down this burden of, of yourself. I think it is such a heavy weight to be this individual that you know, everything is dependent upon you. Gosh, it's so much easier to, you know, to have a little rucksack with just a few things, a couple of prayers that suit you and a calculator to add up your debts. And 
Ja? Where such a result-driven or achievement-driven culture, we expect to know what is happening and to achieve something. But the real spiritual mystery, the real spiritual journey, actually happens deep, deep within us. The Sufis say in the innermost chamber of the heart there is this secret substance that is both the pilgrim and the path. And it is this inner transformation that happens deep within the heart in, in, really to the soul itself. And, um, and most of it is a complete mystery to this consciousness. The, there is a very simple reason for that and that is this consciousness is designed is created to function in this world. It's what you do to go shopping. You know, don't go shopping with a spiritual consciousness, I always say, because all the breakfast cereals will be one. I mean, they're all the <laughs> same anyway, but... Because the real, the real spiritual transformation, it happens to your spiritual body, it happens to your spiritual self. Um, yes, there are side effects in this world that you can have more love, you can have clarity at times, or um, your heart opens. There are many different side effects, but they are basically side effects of the inner transformation of the soul. And um, I always think this is, mo I always, you know, I kind of have a long-term view, spiritual life is a long-term process, um, and you want to take it with you. And as, um, you know, I like, grew up with the Beatles, you know, as like this song of John Lennon's last night, the wife said, you know, when you're dead, you don't take nothing with you but your soul. Um, and if that's what's transformed, and that's what you take with you. So sometimes it affects your conscious life, and sometimes it doesn't. But that is really the... Sometimes you know when you are taken, sometimes you just feel you are taken into this greater mystery, and there is a sense when you come back, oh, I was taken somewhere, I became aware of something, and sometimes you don't. You, you don't look for anything because it's really a, a path of surrender in which you recognize there is a deeper mystery within you that, than your own conscious self. And often your own conscious self becomes not irrelevant because you have to live with it, but less important. And as so I say, the misunderstanding, I think, is that people expect you know, conscious results in their daily life from their spiritual practice. But the spiritual practice, or mystical practice, should I say, is not about that. Yes, there are spiritual practices where you can bring more light into your everyday life where you can bring more awareness or presence into your everyday life. They are very good practices. Um, but mystical life is not about that. It is about a deep surrender to God, to the unknown, if you like, the unknown face of God, a cloud of unknowing. And um, you get given, but often in ways you don't envisage or expect or so it's not really a quality of life improving business. It's a deep giving of yourself to the, the mystery of what it means to be a human being, which is being made in the image of God. And I'm not saying there aren't results, but they're often quite different to what you expect or look for. So, I mean, there is the, you know, there is the, the deep fulfillment of having a living relationship with the other in a capital O. And as Thomas Keating beautifully puts it, then you realize that you and the other are one. There never was another. Um, and the sense is you do begin to go beneath the surface of life into life's deeper mystery. 
as I mentioned at the beginning, I think as a culture that's what we're starved of. We have lots of technology but not so much mystery. At different times and at different places in human history since the very beginning, there have been spiritual teachers and teachings and schools that enabled human beings to access to, and to, to learn about the deeper mystery of what it means to be a human being. This is very, very important. They're actually at different times, the focus of the loci were at different places in the world. Um, there is, for example, the strong tradition that Christ was taken to Egypt, was part of the Essene Brotherhood, which was a mystery school that was present there, and he was taught certain esoteric mysteries before his teaching began. Um, and the... This is like a living spiritual stream that belongs to the esoteric dimension of humanity and that appears at the world in different places and different times under different guises. But actually is the same stream. Some people call it the perennial philosophy. Um, in the Sufi tradition, they're sometimes called the masters of wisdom or the masters of love. This is, this is like a certain current under the surface that belongs to this deeper dimension of humanity that w we as a culture now have forgotten. We have, we have forgotten this inner spectrum, this inner dimension of spirituality. It's not, traditionally it's not something that was learned, you learn in a book or you go to a workshop. Like, you know, my own living experience of this is, you know, my teacher was a Russian woman who went to India and, and was trained by a Sufi master in, in the 60s and then was asked to bring this tradition back to the West where it had never been. And then she came to America in 85 and 87 and then I was asked to, in a way, to bring it here to America where this particular esoteric tradition had never been. Um, and it kind of goes where it is needed at different times in different human history. These different, they're, di they're like threads. They're, they're like, I often call them threads of love that are woven into the fabric of humanity. If they're not there, something begins to be lacking within the human consciousness. On a very practical level, those human beings who are drawn to experience this inner depth within a human being. And I say drawn very particularly because it's not something you do of your own volition, but you have a longing to go beneath the surface and go to explore the very interior realm of being a human being, which in the Sufi tradition is go right into the core of the heart, into the heart of hearts. Um, you need to find a living tradition. You, you can't do it any other way. And so it, it used to be, you know, you, you heard a story about somebody somewhere and you went off and say, uh, my teacher had to go all the way to a small town in India by a rather circuitous route where she met her teacher. Now it's apparently more visible. Um, but this is this inner dimension of humanity that carries the, the deeper mystery of what life is, why we are here, what is the purpose of the human incarnation. Oh, Sufis, you know, Sufis love laughter because um, they just do. There's actually a, a nice story of, uh, of a early, what you might now call, interfaith conference that took place in, in Kashmir many years ago. And um, there was like a, it was in the evening and there were all these different groups and, you know, sitting around the fires and the, everybody at the end of the day went back to their own group. And, and somebody said, you know, you could tell 
what the different groups were. You could see where the Jewish group, because they were discussing things in great detail and <laughs> endless discussions. And, and you could tell which was the Buddhist group because they were all sitting there in, in silence. And, um, and you could tell which was the, you know, the Hindu group because they were doing this beautiful chanting. And you could tell which was a Sufi group because they were just sitting back and laughing and laughing and telling <laughs> stories and laughing. And if you're in a Sufi group, there's always laughter and there's always stories. And because why? Because it's so crazy. The whole thing is so crazy. And, <laughs> and there is also the, I don't like to say it, but a deep spiritual joke to the whole of life, which the Sufis have the key of, you know? And everybody else has to work so hard and do their practices so diligently and the Sufis just love God and, and we are his own personal idiots. We are, Sufis are known as the idiots of God, his own personal idiots. I was once told in a dream he has a special tenderness for his own personal idiots. You know, just, so they just laugh. So they love it. You do with us what you will. We are fairly helpless, fairly hopeless. <laughs> Lost causes, but we love you. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like the story, my favorite Christian story of the three monks and um, who were in this, lived in this cave and, and they had one prayer and their one prayer was, we are three and thou art one and we love thee. And that's all they did. And somehow the people in the town, when they came into contact with these monks, they got healed. Nobody knew why. The monks didn't do any healing ceremonies or purify any water, but they got healed and think miracles happened. And finally the bishop got to hear about this. They were on a, monks lived on an island, a town, and there was a mountain, there was a cave in the mountain. And so the bishop with his retinue came to visit these monks and he got in his boat and he sailed from the city where he had his cathedral and he, sailed to the little harbor and all his retinue went up and, and um, sat with the monks and, um, and eventually, you know, he said, you know, what you're doing is very good, but this is not really a proper prayer. You know, if you're a proper Christian, you need to do the Pater Noster at least. In those days, prayers were all in Latin and anyway, he instructed them again in the Pater Noster and some Ave Marias and I'm not very good on my Christian prayers, but um, you know, and they listened very attentively, and then the sun was coming, setting, so they, the bishop and his retinue got into the boat and um, sailed back towards the, towards the mainland. And, and the lookout suddenly called, look, look, towards the island, and they saw these three lights coming across to the boat very quickly. So they said, they said bring down the sails, you know, stop the boat. And, and the bishop stood and looked out in these three lights. He saw there were these three monks running very quickly across the water. And they came to the boat and they said, Your Grace, Your Grace, can you tell us again these prayers? We have forgotten them. <laughs> and he said, Go back. Do what you were doing before. We are three and thou art one and we love thee. You know? I think they were Sufis, but... They pretended. I remember the first time I came across that was when I read uh, Wilhelm's translation of The Secret of the Golden Flower, which is a Taoist text. Wilhelm, who translated the I Ching, was actually one of the first Westerners to be initiated, this was before the revolution, to be initiated into the ancient Taoist tradition and their techniques, and they were one of the few places in the world at that time that had a living esoteric tradition. And in The Secret of the Golden Flower, they talk about creating a light body. Um, in there, they used certain breathing techniques. But although the spirit, we all have a spiritual body, it's latent within us. And for most people, they, they just, they live a physical life, although it's, and it remains latent. But if you want to do spiritual life, you, you have to activate it, and then through really serious spiritual work, 
you build, you create a light body or a spiritual body that has different, um, it allows you to experience the spiritual world while in this body. Most people, they say, only get to experience the spiritual world after they die. They leave this body behind, they leave this mental <laughs> image of themselves behind, and then they find themselves in the spiritual world where they learn about their spiritual self. Um, one of the first things you have to do is you have to do a certain purification because the spirit body, if it's going to have experiences in the spiritual world, which is much finer than this world, it has to be purified. And that's why Carl Jung, he said, enlightenment does not come from an imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. The latter process, however, is disagreeable and therefore unpopular. Um, there is a real danger if you open yourself to too much spiritual energy before you've done the purification because the spiritual light energy that doesn't come through the spiritual body, it starts to bounce off all the impurities. Um, it just starts to ricochet around inside of you and can be very confusing and very destructive. So um, on some paths they do, you know, they focus on the right diet and the right posture as a way of purifying, they purify the physical body on a particular path that I belong, we, we focus on inner work, which is primarily psychological, uh, working on the shadow, on the darkness within oneself, loving and accepting the dark, rejected parts of oneself. We have incorporated a, a Jungian model to, um, because the Western psyche is slightly different to the Eastern psyche where our tradition came from. And uh, Jung had this understanding of the inner process of transformation that belongs to the spiritual journey. He reinterpreted it from alchemy. Um, and so you begin with the process of purification, of working on the shadow, also working on your negative attitudes and those qualities within you. Um, I find for most people that takes the first seven years, say, of just um, creating the, the vehicle that can then begin to contain the higher spiritual energies that belong to the human being. And then through, um, we pay particular attention to awareness of breath. The awareness of breath is, actually helps to create a powerful and strong inner container. Breath is very essential to most spiritual practice. And the combination of just being aware of the breath is, helps to create a spiritual container together with the meditation practice that we do. And um, one of the, if you build a really healthy container, then you can have access to spiritual energies function at a much faster vibration than the energies in this world. They change much more quickly. Um, you actually also have to learn to think in a different way because most people's thinking is, even their thinking is very, um, very structured and doesn't change very much. And you have to, the spiritual energy changes at a much, can change very, very quickly from moment to moment. Um, so you have to learn to be much more responsive just in your inner attitude and less, um, Less rigid. If you have rigid thinking patterns, don't come near Sufis because the, the frequency of the love actually hits people who have rigid thinking patterns. They don't like it. They can't hold it. Um, so you, gradually over the years through the practices, you create an inner container that allows you to experience the faster, higher energies that belong to your spiritual nature without being disturbed by them. Um, and, um, and hopefully during this time you also develop certain human qualities in order to, to live an ethical life, like respect for others um, and loving kindness. 
um, because that is kind of needed if you are going to live in accord with your higher spiritual nature, which is, it's not that it's better, it's just faster. And the, the more things, when things speed up, they, um, they require a different way to live. Um, and then this inner vehicle is also a vehicle that in deep meditation or during the night can take you to um, take your soul to, to different places in the inner worlds. Most people's soul doesn't travel very much. Even when they're asleep, it just hovers around. It is a very, very particular science, really deep spirituality. It's, you know, it, it is um, it's just a science. It's a science. Our science and technology is focused on the outer world. There is a very deep science of the inner world. So friends, thank you so much for coming together at this time. So nice to be with you all. And we will meet again. Mm -hmm.